In this video, we're focusing on geometric vectors, and you will see that there is nothing challenging about geometric vectors at all. Maybe they take a little bit of getting used to, but that's about it. Now, my first order of business is to convince you that geometric vectors, that is, directed segments, are in fact vectors in the sense of linear algebra, which of course means that they can be added together and multiplied by numbers. Now, I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, already know how to add vectors together and multiply them by numbers, but I'd like to tell you anyway, just to make sure that you think of these operations as completely natural. That's my goal. Now, there's one other note that I would like to make before we begin our discussion, and I hesitate to bring the whole thing up in the first place, but I think that it's very important to make this point, and that is, I encourage you to not imagine a coordinate grid imposed on this plane, because this is how geometric vectors are typically introduced. They're typically introduced from two different perspectives. On the one hand, they're directed segments, but on the other hand, you can think of them as pairs of coordinates of the tip of the vector. Now, if that's your current perspective, then I encourage you to give it up and to think of geometric vectors as nothing more than directed segments, as nothing more than simple drawings, as nothing more than pure geometric objects, because we can accomplish all of our present goals by thinking of geometric vectors in this sense. And as you learn more and more of linear algebra, you will see that in some sense, linear algebra draws its power from combining geometric ideas with algebraic methods. So it's very important to separate the, algebra, uh, the geometric ideas from the algebraic ideas. And geometric vectors is our chance to experience linear algebra in pure geometric terms and to understand where most of the ideas of linear algebra come from, which is the world of geometric vectors. This is part of a larger theme that we'll have in which I advocate that you treat all objects on their own terms. And the terms of geometric vectors is to be treated as pure geometric objects. So enough about that for now. I'll definitely say more on that in the upcoming videos. Right now, let's concentrate on geometric vectors as directed segments and talk about how to add them. Now, we want to think of their addition as a very natural thing. And the way to do it is to think of geometric vectors as relating to locations. So imagine that you are, let's say, let's have our discussion here, that you're currently in the village O and you want to get to the village R. And you ask somebody in the village O, oh, how do I get to the village R? And that person might answer, well, it's 10 miles away from here which is helpful information, but not sufficient information, because that information would narrow it down for you, if it's correct, to this circle right here. Not bad, especially if O is right here. Okay, but you need more. So you would ask another person, where is the village R? And if that person had said, it's in this direction, that alone would have also not been enough because that would have only narrowed it down for you to this ray. So you need both pieces of information. So you need this vector. So this drawing is the perfect way to specify where village R is compared to the village O. And you can say, going back to the discussion we just had, well, that's just a pair of numbers in disguise because they have to tell you that it's 10 miles away and they have to give you the direction, which can be specified by the angle relative to the east direction. Well, that's true. But the same goal could be accomplished simply by drawing this arrow and not mentioning any numbers. So imagine that the, the arrow was actually drawn on the ground. And then all you had to do was follow the arrow, follow the segment, until it ends and you stop right there, and then you're in village R. A very effective way of getting you from point O for origin to point R without any numbers. So it's a very useful object, has great utility, and just think of it 
as relating, giving you the relative locations of two different points. And that leads to a very natural definition of, what it, of, add, of how you would add two vectors, a vector addition. So let's do it here. I'll step out of the shot largely. So suppose you go from village O to village R, and that, let's call it displacement, that travel, is captured by this geometric vector. And then you go from village R to village T, which of course could be captured perfectly by this directed segment, another vector. So let's call, let's give this vector a name A, and we denote geometric vectors by Latin letters with an arrow above them. That's our notation. And we can call this the vector B. Now, what is the net result of your travels? Well, it can be captured by relating your eventual location to your original location. And the best way to do it is to draw this directed segment. Miss, I'm missing it. Is to draw this directed segment. This directed segment captures the net effect of your two travels. And it's another vector. And it is very natural to call this vector the, ve the vector C as the sum of A and B. Let me write it right here. C equals the sum of A and B. A completely natural definition that captures the fact that relating locations, the locations of two points, involves both the distance and the direction. So we're now halfway towards justifying the fact that geometric vectors are vectors in the linear algebra sense. We just have to introduce multiplication by numbers. And that is also done in a completely natural way. If we have a vector v right here, then to multiply it by a number, we have to keep its direction the same, but change its length according to that number. So if this is the vector v connecting the village O to the village R, then the vector 2v has the same direction but twice the length. So it might point to a village T that's in the same direction from the village O as the village R, but twice as far. There could be another village in the same direction, but half the distance to the village R, and that of course would be associated with the vector 1 half V. So we can multiply geometric vectors by numbers greater than 1, which makes them longer, and by numbers less than 1, that makes them shorter, which makes them shorter, all along keeping the direction constant. We can also multiply geometric vectors by negative numbers, which means reversing the direction, looking for a village that's in the direction opposite of the village R. So this would be the vector minus V. And if there is another location in the opposite direction but twice as far, it would be associated with the vector negative 2V, and so forth. So you can see now that we can multiply geometric vectors in a completely natural way by any number whatsoever. So we're now able to add geometric vectors, multiply them by numbers, which means that we have justified the fact that geometric vectors in the plane are vectors in the sense of linear algebra. So now let's talk about vectors along one line and then vectors in three dimensions. And everything is the same and we just have to realize that the same definitions work. So if we consider vectors along one straight line, I will largely leave it up to you to realize that the same tip-to-toe, tip-to-tail definition continues to work and that we can add two vectors together and the result would be, let me use another color and just shift it slightly so you can see another vector along the same line. And we can multiply these vectors along, the along this line by any number, and the result would be another vector along the same line. So you can consider the world of vectors in the whole plane, or you can consider the world of vectors along a single line. 
And in neither case, the world is completely self-sufficient. You can add two vectors from those worlds and the result is another vector from that same world. And you can multiply any vector from that world by any number. And the result is once again a vector in that same class of vectors. Right? So we can consider vectors in the plane. We can consider vectors along a straight line. We can also consider vectors in the three-dimensional space. And then we'll no longer think of villages on Earth, but now we maybe have to think about different planets in the solar system and a spaceship flying from one planet to another, from one location in three dimensions to another. So you can think about spaceships and solar systems or a fly and objects in your room. And if the fly first flew from this point to this point, and then from this point to this point, then the net effect of its travels can be captured by this vector right here. And once again, this definition is completely geometric and 100% analogous to this definition. So we can work with geometric vectors on the plane along a straight line and in three dimensions, and it works perfectly. And I just want to make one note about the addition of vectors in three dimensions, and that will give you a good idea of the kind of geometric complexity involved in our linear algebra discussions, which is minimal. And here's the statement that I want, want to make and something for you to think about after the, you've done watching this video. And that is, when you have one geometric vector and another, these two vectors together define a plane, a plane in which these two vectors lie. And you have to realize that their sum, this vector right here, is also in the same plane. So there is some self-consistency in that situation as well. Whatever two vectors are, their sum lies in the same plane as those two vectors. Just a very simple and fundamental observation about adding vectors in three dimensions. But it's very important to have this three-dimensional picture in mind and to be able to visualize this configuration of vectors. We won't have to do much more from the point of view of geometric imagination and ability. So that's it for this video. 